Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is October 29, 1977, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 27. Fifteen years ago yesterday, on October 28, 1962, America breathed a sigh of relief as the Cuban Missile Crisis ended in surrender by the Soviet Union. On that Sunday morning, Radio Moscow announced that all work on the offensive missile sites in Cuba was being stopped and that they would be dismantled under United Nations observation. So ended six days in which the world teetered visibly on the brink of nuclear war thanks to a dangerous Soviet gamble. The public crisis had begun with a televised speech by President John F. Kennedy on Monday evening, October 22, 1962. Tens of millions of Americans huddled before our TV sets, having been told in news reports all day long that something big was afoot. When President Kennedy told us that Soviet offensive nuclear missiles were almost operational in Cuba, some Americans were taken by surprise, others were not. Those who were not surprised had heard the warnings of the late Senator Kenneth Keene of New York. For more than a year he had been warning about the Cuban missiles and speeches nationwide. But many other Americans were shocked to hear about the missiles from President Kennedy that evening. Some had never heard Senator Keating's earlier warnings thanks to a major media blackout on the story. Others had heard but they had believed the denials issued by the government. But what was stunning to everyone, the Kremlin included, was the response by President Kennedy to the Cuban Missile Threat. Avoiding use of the word blockade, which in international law is an act of war, President Kennedy announced a so-called quarantine on offensive shipments to Cuba. It would be enforced by what was then the most powerful Navy on Earth the United States Navy. Furthermore, the President demanded that the missile sites be dismantled and Soviet forces withdrawn, otherwise stronger action by America was threatened. Then came the bone-chilling words, quote, Any missile launched from Cuba against any nation shall be regarded as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring full retaliation." Unquote. Refusing to pretend that Cuba was the culprit, Jack Kennedy confronted the Soviet Union head-on, and in terms of the one thing that commands Soviet respect, military power. The great historian Carol Quigley, who passed away early this year, summarized the circumstances of the Cuba crisis very accurately in his monumental work, Tragedy and Hope, published by Macmillan in 1966. Quote, the dominant fact in the whole situation was the overwhelming character of America's power, and the fact that this was known both to the White House and to the Kremlin, but was largely unknown and certainly unpublicized to the world. Around the Soviet Union's border were 144 Polaris, 103 Atlas, 159 Thor, Jupiter, and Titan missiles, 1,600 long-range bombers, many of them constantly in the air with nuclear bombs. When the President's speech began the public crisis, five divisions of the United States Army Strategic Reserve, totally about 100,000 men, plus 100,000 Air Force and an equal number of Naval and Marine personnel had been mobilized or alerted. The 1st Armored Division had been flown from Texas to the East Coast. Ninety Naval vessels, including eight carriers, were on patrol to blockade. A Cuban Invasion Command had been assembled in Florida, and 2,700 relatives of military personnel had been evacuated from Guantanamo. Under such pressure, Khrushchev wilted. It might almost be said that he panicked on Feb Friday, October the 26th." Unquote. And two days later Radio Moscow made the announcement giving in to Kennedy's demands. Many critics have pointed out that after the crisis itself, America seemingly left needless loopholes for Soviet cheating 
in the Cuban withdrawal process, but regardless of that, it was the overwhelming power of America that prevented nuclear war in the Cuban crisis itself. Two years before the Cuban crisis, General Nathan Twining, retiring as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, warned America, quote, forces that cannot win will not deter." Unquote. These few words of common sense distill the lessons of several thousand years of military history, and in October 1962 the Cuban Missile Crisis proved that they are as true in the nuclear age as they ever were before. One would think that such a close brush with nuclear disaster would have alerted the American people to the realities of survival in an enduring way, but it did not. The 4 to 1 military advantage over Russia enjoyed by America in 1962 was not brought home to the American public as the critical factor that had prevented a war. It was only later, in context with words like overkill, measured response, and mutual assured destruction that our previous military preponderance was brought to public attention, and the purpose then was to whittle it down to nothing. But if the American people failed to learn the lesson of Cuba, the Kremlin did not. The lesson was learned best of all by Leonid Brezhnev, Khrushchev's rocket boss. Khrushchev's failure in the Cuban Missile Affair was the beginning of the end for him in the Kremlin. Yet, ironically, when Khrushchev was deposed in 1964, it was none other than Brezhnev who had actually masterminded the Cuban Missile Plan who took Khrushchev's place. And Brezhnev was determined that the Soviet Union would not again suffer such a debacle. Today the similarities to the Cuban Missile Crisis are striking. Now as then we are again targeted with short-range nuclear missiles, except this time they are lurking within our own territorial waters, ready for underwater launch upon satellite command. Now as then the Soviet Missile Crisis has been underway for more than a year, and the American people are kept ignorant of the facts by the major media blackout of the story and by government denials. And now as then, the dominant fact is the lopsided military advantage possessed by one side. But this time it isn't just missiles that threaten us. It also includes underwater nuclear mines strewn throughout our own country by Soviet agents. And again the public is being deceived jointly by the Federal Government and the controlled major media, not merely by silence and denials but by propaganda that helps to cover up hostilities that are already being directed against us by our enemy. Worst of all, the lopsided military imbalance now favors not America but the Soviet Union. During the past month unusually rapid, puzzling, and dramatic changes have begun sweeping across the international arena. In the Middle East, Three years of Soviet eclipse have suddenly been ended by a joint Soviet-American decoration, and in the process a drastic change in American policy toward Israel has surfaced. Red China, after a decade of bitter struggling with the Soviet Union, suddenly began making concrete moves toward reconciliation with Russia early this month. India's Prime Minister Desai, who used to denounce Communism, traveled to Moscow early this month and now says India's friendship with the Soviet Union is, quote, cemented, unquote. News and commentary suddenly assure us that a thaw is taking place between the Soviet Union and the United States, and on all sides disarmament has all of a sudden become the overriding topic in world affairs. These developments and many more have all come about since America's disastrous defeat by the Soviet Union last month on September 27, 1977, 
in the still secret battle of the Harvest Moon. This was history's first full-fledged space battle, and as I told you in detail last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the Soviet Union emerged as the only possessor of the decisive new Particle Beam weapon. It is this Soviet military breakthrough that is at the root of what now looks like an avalanche of diplomatic breakthroughs involving the Soviet Union all over the world. As it stands now, my friends, the cold, hard truth is this. The Soviet Union could attack the United States now and win, but American retaliation could nevertheless inflict considerable suffering on Russia as the price of such a Soviet conquest, and they prefer to destroy us without suffering themselves, and that is the direction in which events are now moving. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, the Soviet Particle Beam and Killer Satellites. Topic No. 2, the spreading atomic plague called Legionnaire's Disease. And Topic No. 3, the enforced disarming of America now underway. Topic No. 1. Last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, recorded September 30, 1977, I revealed the fact that the Soviet Union has become the first nation on earth to possess a new superweapon, the Particle Beam, which is now deployed in Earth orbit. The first Particle Beam Killer Satellite was launched three months ago on July 17, 1977 and is known as COSMOS 929. As I told you last month, the first operational test against the target was carried out over the Soviet Union during the early hours of September 20, 1977. An American spy satellite was blasted into a huge fireball that was seen hundreds of miles away. Exactly two weeks later, on October 4, 1977, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown held a news conference in which he shocked everyone with the unexpected words, and I quote, There is a fact of Soviet anti-satellite, not only development but operational capability, unquote. And he added, quote, That's something of concern to me because we rely a good deal on our space systems for support of our military capability which capability I think contributes to deterring, preventing war." Unquote. After Dr. Brown spoke, other defense officials singled out our low-flying spy satellites as being vulnerable to the Soviet killer satellites, which are also known as COSMOS interceptors. However, neither Dr. Brown nor the other spokesmen would explain for the record and for the American people how the new COSMOS interceptors work, after all the Russians know. Reporters were therefore left with nothing to suggest in their articles except a ten-year-old Soviet anti-satellite concept of an explosive interceptor which would maneuver close to the target and then blow up. The fact that Particle Beam weapons are involved was not mentioned. In January of this year, the outgoing Pentagon Research Director, Dr. Malcolm Curry, gave Congress a warning. He said that it would be catastrophic to let the Soviets gain an advantage over us in the area of anti-satellite weapons, and no wonder. Satellites today play a central role in the military communications, intelligence gathering, and early warning of any possible attack. Unusual troop movements or other preparations for attack can be detected, and even the firing of ICBMs will be detected only by satellites. Without our spy satellites, we would be blinded to any surprise attack by strategic missiles. And yet the SALT II Accord, which Jimmy Carter is now working so feverishly to promote, includes no provision at all against anti-satellite weapons. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 at the end of last month, 
four days before Dr. Brown's stunning announcement about operational Soviet killer satellites, there were two Cosmos 929-class interceptors in orbit. Now there are eight, and now the Soviet Union is picking off American strategic satellites one by one creating a tremendous fireball each time like the one I described to you last month. On October 13, earlier this month, CBS Radio News reported that a number of people have expressed concern about seeing several fireballs over Russia. They inquired what they could be, thinking they might be UFOs from outer space. But a Russian scientist who was interviewed about it said the fireballs were nothing to worry about that they were merely Cosmos phenomena. And of course he was telling the truth in a tongue-in-cheek way, since the recent astonishing fireball phenomena are caused by Cosmos particle beam interceptors. But the granddaddy of all the fireballs so far was the one which erupted over the United States on the evening of October 18, just 11 days ago. Hundreds of witnesses reported seeing the huge fireball all the way from the McDonald Observatory in extreme southwest Texas to points over 700 miles away in Arkansas and Missouri, as well as in the neighboring states of Oklahoma and Louisiana. It was so bright that people hundreds of miles apart thought it had hit near them, and so huge that astronomers said it should have reached the ground. But according to radar and military observers, it exploded in mid-air with a bright flash. Whether any pieces survived to hit the ground is not known at this time. Thus the 85-ton American Space Station known as Skylab, launched four years ago, came to a spectacular end at the hands of a Soviet Cosmos interceptor. The Soviet Union wanted to ensure that Skylab could not be pressed into service by America in any way to begin to undo the fast-growing Soviet domination of space. And just in case any chunks of the big space station should reach the ground without burning out, thereby possibly doing damage or injury, Skylab was destroyed over the United States instead of over the Soviet Union. Nine days later the government released an elaborate cover story about Skylab by way of the CBS Evening News for October 27, 1977. While we were shown official NASA film of Skylab in orbit, we were told that for some strange reason Skylab's orbit is decaying sooner than expected, and that it might well come down prematurely. Now, my friends, if someone should find pieces of it lying around, the groundwork has already been laid for a future public explanation. The Soviet use of their new particle beam weapon to blow our strategic satellites out of the sky is bad enough, but this is only the beginning. As I explained in detail last month, America's secret moon base in Copernicus Crater was put out of action on September 27, 1977. It was bombarded with a Soviet neutron particle beam which killed all of our astronauts there. The Copernicus base was itself equipped with particle beam weaponry, but was defeated by the Soviet Union just before achieving operational status. Thus America lost the Battle of the Harvest Moon, and though this space battle is still a secret, its consequences are cropping up all around us. In Topics No. 2 and 3 I will try to bring you up to date on what has happened militarily and diplomatically as the result of our losing the battle of the Harvest Moon. Right now, though, let me tell you the latest developments in space itself. On September 29, 1977, just two days after the Battle of the Harvest Moon and the Gromyko ultimatum to Jimmy Carter, the Soviet Union launched Soyuz Space Station No. 6. This was the same day that an Atlas Centaur rocket became the second American rocket in two weeks to explode during launch. The orbiting of Soyuz 6, my friends, signaled the beginning of the first Soviet manned mission to the moon, and the next day, as the Soviet moon era was just dawning, the sun set on America's moon era. 
the NASA Space Center in Houston radioed Remote Control Commands to the moon to shut down all automated equipment still operating there, and as usual the quiet and largely unnoticed news reports about it told us this was being done to save money. On October 9, Soyuz 25 was launched with a two-man crew to rendezvous with Soyuz 6, and just as the crew of Apollo 11 carried an American flag with them to plant on the moon, the crew of Soyuz 25 took a copy of the newly adopted Soviet Constitution with them. As Mission Commander Kovalyanuk climbed aboard the spacecraft, he gave not the usual friendly wave, but a clenched fist salute for the benefit of the television audience. Then Soyuz 25 lifted off from the same pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome that had been used 20 years ago to launch Sputnik 1. Less than two days later, Radio Moscow broke a 24-hour silence about the mission, which had caused many observers to wonder if the cosmonauts might have suffered harm. It was announced that the cosmonauts were in good condition and that their Soyuz 25 capsule had landed safely. Supposedly the mission had been aborted because of the failure of Soyuz 25 to dock successfully with Soyuz 6, but actually, my friends, Soyuz 25 was successful in its rendezvous with Soyuz 6. The purpose was not to dock and remain in orbit but rather to link up to a Lunar Propulsion and Equipment Module, and this Soyuz 25 did. By the time Radio Moscow broke its silence with a cover story about an aborted mission, Soyuz 25 was on its way to the Moon. On October 16, after achieving lunar orbit, the crew of Soyuz 25 detached a radio relay package and left it in lunar orbit as they descended to the lunar surface. And just as two Americans named Armstrong and Aldrin became the first human beings to set foot on the near side of the moon, two Russians named Kovalinuk and Ryuman have become the first to land on the far side of the moon in Jules Verne Crater. The Soviet Union is now working rapidly to do the same thing that the controlled United States Government had tried to do to set up a Particle Beam weapons base on the Moon from which to menace the Earth. The operation now underway in Jules Verne Crater is strictly an interim step. The back side of the Moon is being used purely as a safe haven, and there all preliminary preparations can be made without any chance, they hope, of observation or retaliation by the United States. The plan is to assemble everything that is needed for an initial Particle Beam installation, including equipment, crews of cosmonauts, life support equipment, and so forth, in a safe backside location. Then rockets will be used to transport everything to the intended location on the near side, rapidly and all at once. If all goes according to plan, the Soviet Particle Beam Base will be able to become operational very quickly after the fast move to the near side. In this way the Soviet Union expects to have its Particle Beam Moon Base in operation and able to protect itself before any conceivable preemptive strike could knock it out. They have no wish to suffer the same fate they themselves inflicted a month ago on the secret American Moon Base. Once it is operational with a charged Particle Beam weapon to protect itself, the Soviet Moon Base will be relatively secure in a military sense. This is especially true since a small fleet of Cosmos interceptors are now in Earth orbit, armed as they are with Particle Beam weapons. Therefore, once the Soviet Moon Base is in operation on the near side of the Moon, the Soviet Union may well choose to make it known to the world, neglecting, of course, to explain its true purpose. If so, it will be a startling echo of the early days of the Soviet space program, when spectacular exploits in space were always announced only after they were successfully underway, never beforehand. According to my latest intelligence on the Soviet Moon mission, the project is progressing very rapidly. As of two days ago, October 27, 
the crew of Soyuz 25 have already been joined at Jules Verne Crater by additional cosmonauts, and the components for a particle beam weapon have also arrived. At this rate, the space lift of crew and equipment to the near side of the moon might come very soon, and if it does, the timing would be perfect for Soviet propaganda purposes. The 20th anniversary of Sputnik 1, which was October 4, was commemorated by launching Soyuz 25 from the same launch pad as was used for Sputnik 1. Still ahead on November 7 is the 60th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. How better to impress the world with the vigor of the Soviet system than by having the brand new Soviet Constitution praised over worldwide television by a cosmonaut broadcasting from the moon. Topic No. 2 When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 26 last month on September 30, I alerted you to the fact that Soviet submarines were on their way in great numbers to surround the United States. A military confrontation was definitely underway, and I warned you that the possibility of war itself could not be ignored. Only the previous weekend the Soviet Union had abruptly expelled all Western fishing trawlers from the Barents Sea, where the big Murmansk naval base is located. On Tuesday, September 27, the secret space battle of the Harvest Moon ended the existence of the American Moon Base in Copernicus Crater, and by that day both the Barents Sea and also the Sea of Okhotsk off the Kamchatka Peninsula were swarming with Soviet submarines. While these military developments were going on behind the scenes, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered a veiled ultimatum to the United States during a very harsh speech at the United Nations, and that evening at Gromyko's demand a sudden and unexpected meeting was held at the White House between Gromyko, Jimmy Carter, and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. Last month I told you what Gromyko told Carter in very blunt language, and the very next day the two huge Soviet submarine fleets left their staging areas to converge on the United States. Since NATO regards the deployment to sea of the Soviet submarine force as a major warning signal of impending conflict, the situation was potentially very grave indeed. So I warned you, based on information from my own intelligence sources, that by October 7, if not before, the United States would be surrounded along our east, west, and Gulf coasts by the Soviet submarine fleet. On October 5, early this month, Vice Admiral William Reed, Commander of our Atlantic Fleet Naval Surface Forces, revealed at the Southeast Sea Power Symposium in Atlanta, Georgia, the fact that Soviet submarines, together with many surface ships, were present in great numbers along our Atlantic and Gulf coasts, and, he said, they were close enough to destroy American cities in a nuclear war. He added that in any long war with the Soviet Union, America would be at a grave disadvantage because of the size and effectiveness of the Soviet Navy. The next day, October 6, a naval spokesman in San Diego was reported by a local radio station to have said that large numbers of Soviet submarines had been sighted in the Pacific, also heading in our direction. On the morning of October 7, 1977, my own reports indicated that the Pacific Armada was about 700 miles west of San Francisco at its closest point and was spread out over an area of ocean 1,000 miles long north to south and 200 miles deep. The Atlantic Armada was some 1,600 miles from New York City at its closest point, spread out over a similar area of ocean. At that point the Pacific Armada was slowing down to enable the Atlantic Armada to close in to a similar distance. In the Gulf of Mexico, meanwhile, the fleet of 29 submarines, which were already on station when I recorded AUDIO LETTERS No. 26, were simply staying there waiting. By the evening of October 9, 
the Pacific Armada was on station, in battle formation, spread out along our entire west coast at a distance of 400 miles. The Atlantic Armada was just over 500 miles from New York City at its closest point, but still had the job of spreading out to parallel the East Coast Line. While this was being done, the fleet west of our shores began injecting a radiochemical poison into our air by means of powerful fluorocarbon dispensers. This technique of radiological warfare is exactly the same as I described one year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 17 in connection with the Soviet submarine confrontation that occurred at that time, but this time the formulation involves both plutonium, which is radioactive, and zirconium. As I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, this combination is what causes so-called Legionnaires' disease, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Early that day, October 9, British Foreign Minister David Owen left London unexpectedly for a hurried two-day trip to Moscow. The stated cover for the trip was to discuss Rhodesia and trade matters, but Owen was actually going to Moscow to capitulate. In spite of all the things Great Britain has been trying to do to stand up to the Kremlin, the Soviet particle beam breakthrough and America's loss in this decisive race has made the situation untenable. The evening of the following day Vice President Mondale was recalled to Washington out of a Columbus Day parade in San Francisco. The crisis was deepening. By midday October 12 the peak threat from the Soviet submarine fleet was in progress. In the west the fleet had moved to within 250 miles from shore. In the east the Soviets had moved to within less than 150 miles of New York City, and along our Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf Coast lines Soviet submarines were essentially halted in position for attack at any moment. The Western Fleet continued injecting radiochemical poisons into our air, including for a while Strontium-90. There were fresh reports of fireballs over Russia that day, and the same day it was announced that Leonid Brezhnev will soon visit Britain due to the progress made during Owen's weekend visit. Secretary of Defense Harold Brown, in Europe for talks with our NATO allies, now headed for Yugoslavia as had been announced. According to my own information, a high United States Government official conveyed America's capitulation to the Soviet Union on October 14 through intermediary channels. I have not been able to confirm the identity of this official but the fact that Brown was in Yugoslavia on that day may not be coincidence. In any event, the Soviet threat of war served its intended purpose as well. It placed the United States in a position in which any attempt to retaliate against the Soviets for destroying our moon base would have been suicidal. In particular, it ensured that there would be no American attempt to interfere with the Soviet moon mission which took place during this period. In this respect, it was a Cuban Missile Crisis all over again, but with the roles of America and Russia reversed. The Kremlin are well aware that the situation now confronting the real rulers of America is totally new to them, and they really do not know what to do. For the first time they no longer have an invisible ace up their sleeve to make Russia toe the line, but the Soviet display of military power and readiness to use it made the controlled Carter Administration cave in, just as Khrushchev had caved in under the same pressures 15 years ago. The Russians are well known for their ability to win games of chess, and they were not to be bluffed. As a result, America surrendered to the Soviet Union on October 14, 1977, on terms I will reveal in Topic No. 3 and the Soviet acceptance of that surrender was indicated on October 15 as the bulk of the Soviet submarine fleets turned away from America's shores and began heading for home. By October 16 all but two of the submarines along our Gulf Coast were already heading back into Cuban waters where they were congregated along the north coast east of Camagüey 
by October 18. The Eastern and Western Armadas were far out to sea by then, except for five each that stayed on station near our shores. On October 17, with the Soviet Navy safely out of its threatening posture, NATO began its own two-week naval exercises in the Atlantic, but the twelve Soviet submarines which had stayed behind along our shores continued to spew plutonium zirconium poisons into our atmosphere to produce Legionnaire's disease without any interference. Legionnaire's disease, like so-called swine flu, is an artificial disease caused by radiological warfare. My confidential intelligence sources enabled me to warn that the Government's swine flu program was a hoax to cover up the effects of radiological warfare in America as early as April 1976 in AUDIO LETTER No. 11, just after the program was announced by President Gerald Ford. And in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, one year ago this month, I was able to tell the full story of the swine flu hoax, Legionnaire's disease, and additional strange illnesses that were cropping up at that time. At this time last year the Soviet Union had begun a program of experimental plutonium cloud attacks against America's population using a formulation that was intended to produce a swine flu-like illness, but that project was never as effective as desired, and more recently they began experimenting with the plutonium zirconium formulation that produces so-called Legionnaire's disease. This had been tested first at the American Legion Convention in July 1976, where 180 people became ill and 28 died. Recent cloud attacks by Soviet submarines have shown that this is a more effective poison than the earlier one, as Legionnaire's disease is showing up increasingly nationwide. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, Legionnaire's disease is basically a form of radiation sickness caused deliberately at will by secret radiological warfare by the Soviet Union. Recently it has been announced that a peculiar pneumonia bacterium has been linked with Legionnaire's disease, but this is only a complication. The basic cause which weakens the body to permit this bacterial complication is the Soviet radiochemical poison in our air. Not everyone falls ill who is exposed to the poison in the low concentrations currently found in our air. Those who are in good basic health, who get sufficient rest and proper nutrition, have the best chance of avoiding its effects. They are also the ones who are most likely to survive if they do contract Legionnaire's disease. The mortality rate is about 15% the same now as it was in the first big outbreak in Philadelphia. Antibiotics can affect the bacterial complication, but in no way affect the basic cause, which is radiological. So far the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta claims that Legionnaire's disease has been reported by 22 states and the District of Columbia. Some spokesmen are now referring to it as, quote, atypical pneumonia, unquote but call it what you will, it is spreading. Many doctors still are not familiar with it, so here is a list of the symptoms which accompany Legionnaire's disease. Typically it begins with a general malaise and headaches. Within a day this is followed by a rapidly rising fever which may reach levels of from 102 to 105 degrees, together with chills. A hacking cough, stomach ache, nausea, and diarrhea are common, sometimes including bleeding. Yet as severe as it is, it is not contagious, that is, passed from one person to another. Everyone contracts it from the same source, namely the air we breathe. Not everyone gets all the symptoms. Different people seem to be affected somewhat differently. In small children I am informed that it can show up as an especially severe form of croup due to the strong effect of the plutonium zirconium poison in the air passage of the throat. It may be that this is the reason for the unusually severe outbreaks of croup now occurring in some of our northern states, which state health officials are at a loss to explain. My friends, 
we in the United States, together with people in certain parts of Canada and Mexico, are the victims of a spreading atomic plague. It's produced by undeclared warfare, radiological warfare on the part of the Soviet Union to demoralize and weaken our will to resist the final takeover. Thanks to the surrender to the Kremlin by the Carter Administration this month, it's not the Soviet Union that will be laying down its arms, but we ourselves. Topic No. 3 In a news conference on September 29, 1977, President Carter told reporters that there was no prospect of any immediate agreement on a Second Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty or SALT II. Two days earlier, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko had denounced the sorry state of Soviet-American relations in very harsh terms, and had demanded that a new SALT Accord be agreed upon, quote, without any delay, unquote. And in a hastily called meeting that evening, Gromyko made it clear that the Kremlin, having put the secret American moon base out of operation that day, was now going to start cracking the whip. But Carter's response was more one of shock than one of immediate total capitulation and therefore the Soviet submarines began moving toward America within hours after Gromyko left the White House. The surrender by the United States on October 14 involved America's acceptance of Soviet demands for a new SALT II agreement that will effectively disarm America while leaving Soviet armaments free to expand and develop still further. The only concession granted by Brezhnev to Carter is a slight extension of time to allow the Carter Administration to prepare the way for America's acceptance of the treaty to strip us militarily. The extent of the radical shift in favor of the Soviet Union concerning disarmament was revealed on October 19 at the United Nations. There in a committee away from the limelight, but visible to key members of the world's diplomatic community, Major statements were made by both the United States and the Soviet Union. The American statement expressed our willingness to cooperate and declared that an agreement on a whole range of issues may be just around the corner. The Soviet statement spoke of closing the arms race and said Russia is ready to proceed with, quote, drastic disarmament measures, unquote, and the American delegate, Mr. Fisher, expanded on the fact that he now found a new sense of vigor and urgency, stressing that the world is experiencing a fundamental shift in thinking about disarmament. My friends, worldwide fundamental shifts in thinking about anything do not happen without there being a reason, and that reason, as I have told you, is the end of the American moon base and the exclusive possession by the Soviet Union of the new Particle Beam Super Weapon. The following day details began leaking out about the shape of the proposed SALT II Accord, and it will continue to be the subject of heavy news coverage and debate. SALT II contains tremendous concessions by the United States, with none of significance by the Soviet Union even on its face. For example, Jimmy Carter canceled the B-1 bomber, much to the Kremlin's delight, with a silly argument that the cruise missile would replace it. The cruise missile, my friends, is more vulnerable to Soviet air defenses than the B-1 would have been. But now SALT II will even put the cruise missile out of business by restricting its range sufficiently to force our old slow B-52s to get so close to Russia in an attack that they can be shot down by the vast Soviet air defense system. In addition, the United States will agree not to provide cruise missiles or the technology to build them to our NATO allies, to whom the cruise missile could be very valuable. In return for this, America is to settle for a Soviet pledge about their supersonic backfire bomber, their rough equivalent of our B-1 bomber. According to NATO intelligence, the Soviet Union is already flying more than 400 backfires. In other words, they already have a larger force of brand new 
supersonic strategic backfires than our force of 20-year-old subsonic tired-out B-52s. And what's more, the newest version has even greater range than our B-52, and Soviet plants are churning out more backfires every month. But the Carter Administration has settled for a promise from the Soviets not to start producing backfires any faster than they are doing already. What's more, the Kremlin has simply given its word that backfires will not be deployed in a strategic manner despite their strategic capability. In return for that, we agree not to count their backfires at all as strategic bombers thereby exempting them from the limits of weaponry spelled out in SALT II. And we agree to trust them, not requiring verification of any kind. Can you imagine? But as serious as these matters are, they are overshadowed by the seriousness of what is left out altogether from the SALT II proposals. They say not a word about the radiological warfare weapons which are being used right now on the United States. They say nothing at all about anti-satellite weapons despite their disastrous implications and despite the fact that even the Defense Department admits they are now operational in the Soviet arsenal. SALT II would do nothing to restrict the use of microwave weapons on humans, which as I reveal in AUDIO LETTER No. 20 for January 1977 is also being done by the Soviet Union, and beam weapons particularly the Particle Beam, which is the exclusive property of Russia now, are ignored altogether. Thus, for example, our strategic missile forces are rapidly being neutralized while those of the Soviet Union are preserved. Our early warning satellites, which we depend upon to warn us of any attack by the Soviet Union, are being destroyed by Cosmos Interceptor satellites. And if we were to launch our missiles, properly deployed Soviet particle beams could be used to destroy the warheads in flight. The rough equivalents in missiles that the Soviet Union now seems ready to write into the SALT II Accord therefore means nothing. What is actually being inaugurated now is the total disarmament of America. Those who are using their influence to have America accept the SALT II Agreement claim that by granting the Soviet Union such horrendous concessions, we will take away any Soviet incentive to go to war. But, my friends, this is the intellectual way to say, better red than dead. But if the Alice in Wonderland world of unreality that is built into SALT II is accepted, then we as a nation will be both red and dead. It has taken 200 years to undo the structure for freedom and prosperity that was devised by our Founding Fathers, and more than once the United States has been all but counted out by those who wanted to destroy us, only to see America rise again, bounce back, and go on. The Kremlin has no intention of taking that risk by ultimately sparing us from war. They intend to destroy the American system once and for all, and our disarmament beforehand is purely for the purpose of making their destruction of our land easy and without suffering on their own part. When ancient Carthage was destroyed, the Romans plowed salt into the ground to ensure that Carthage would never rise again. Now the Soviet Union is using the salt treaties to ensure that America, once defeated, will never rise again. My friends, this is the legacy that America is inheriting. Thanks to the totally disastrous policies which have been forced on America by the four Rockefeller brothers for decades, I have been accused on occasion of carrying on a personal vendetta against them, and sometimes against the whole family whom I have never accused of being party to what the four brothers are doing. But it is not personal. I do not make public what I know about their personal lives, but I do believe that their policies which affect millions of other lives should be made public. David, Nelson, Lawrence, and John D. Rockefeller III 
have never done anything to me personally, but their policies have brought the land I love, the United States of America, to the brink of utter ruin. Knowing what I know, I have only two possible choices, either speak out or keep quiet, and I cannot keep quiet. To understand why I say this, you have to go through what I've gone through. You have to suffer. You have to turn over and toss at night, asking yourself, what's happened to this great country? It's always been my hope that the four Rockefeller brothers would see the light and honestly turn aside from policies which are destroying America. As a great religious leader once told their grandfather, John D. Rockefeller, Sr., great wealth is a trust, and it should be used for the public good. As of now, none of the things that could be done to save America are being done. It may be too late to save America as we know it, but it is never too late to do what is right and leave the success or failure of our efforts in the hands of our Lord. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.